So you, you saw you saw that reinforcement learning is very important. Why? Because in our world, very often time we don't really have teachers. We just want to optimize something. We want to receive the best reward. To, we want to accomplish some, uh, something. So, and very often time we combine reinforcement learning with deep learning. That's why we have AlphaGo and we have a lot of intelligent uh, systems. Now let me talk about deep learning. Basically, uh, in the last 50 years, people talk about the neural networks to mimic the organization of the brain. In our brain, we have many neurons that are connected to each other, and, and actually each neuron connects to a lot of neurons. This is the simplified mathematical model for the neurons. You have a lot of input, but each of them is connected to a lot of other neurons. That's why you have a lot of input. And you summarize those input, and then if the input satisfies some property, this neuron will, will fire, right? It will become very active. So this is the model for a single neuron. Then the single neuron cannot do a lot of things, right? It's very simple. And if you basically put a lot of neurons together, now you can see we have a neural network. It's a network consist, uh, consist, uh, consisting of a lot of neurons and the connections. This, here you have an input layer, you have input data here, and then the network will do some process, processing and then make a prediction or do something that you want. This is called a neural network. And this is very interesting. Why? You can see the weight over here for each of them, you have a weight, is actually a representation of the data. For instance, if you just want to detect whether the input is an image too, now you can see without uh, it's not surprising that finally the weight will look like this. So the first one, for the first input, the first pixel, the value is very, very low. The second, this is the second input, the value is very high, and so on. Why? Basically, the neural, the neural network can learn the pattern of the input. Why? Because if this pattern, this, those weights are very similar to the input image set 2, then this guy will fire. If they are not very related, then this guy will not fire, right? You ask this neuron to fire if the input is two. That's why the neuron, the neural network, can really learn to do so, can memorize the patterns of the data. Even if the input is this guy, then this one will not fire, okay? Because the product, the thing over here, the sum is not very high. But if the input is this one with this weight, then the value will be very high very big, and then the neuron will, will, will fire. So this is how you can understand neural networks. You just have a way to extract the property of the input data. And later you can see how important this is, especially when you use a, a deep network. So here, essentially, if you have multiple layers, you can each of them in the neuron, and then you have a connection over here, you can see you can extract different kind of features. Here you have lower features. This is the raw input, you have a lot of input images, color images, and here you can see those things correspond to the edges. And those things at a higher level correspond to face features, different kinds of different features and faces. So basically, over here you can even have a higher level representation of the input face. You can see different kinds of faces, different possibilities. So now you can see by making use of this deep structure, you can automatically learn different levels of features. And those features are very useful. Why? Because you have a, if you have this, those features, you have a better understanding of those things. Right? We, human, we humans always have a better understanding, have a high level representation of understanding of the world. When we have the image with all this face, something here will fire. Right? It tells you that all oh, there's a face with some property and so on. That's why deep learning is so useful. It's an automatic way powerful way to extract features, high level features of the input. And also it's very flexible, that's why you can make very good prediction with deep networks. Okay, so uh, you can use deep networks, this is just a structure with a lot of uh, neurons and uh, connections. You can use this for simple learning to make prediction, on simple learning to extract features, remember, with autoencoder and to do reinforcement learning. And this has been, be, uh, has, um, and we demonstrate it to be very powerful. And here, if you want to there are two essential uh, assumptions underlying deep learning. First of all, you should have a lot, a lot of data. Why? Because you have so many 
things to learn. You have such a complex structure, network structure. You want to learn something, then you have to make use of a lot of data. Without a lot of data, you are going to end up with overfitting. You can only explain what you see. You cannot generalize. And also, you assume that all possible scenarios are covered. That's why you can make very good, very good prediction. If you, the input is something that you, 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 uh, you never seen, then clearly you can make a good prediction. So this is a very important assumption um, underlying deep learning. And this is very problematic. Why? Because in view of problems, we cannot really say so. We cannot really assume this is the case. So let me give a, so for image recognition or audio uh, speech recognition, it's not a big deal. Why? Because kind of we speak in similar ways, right? It's not a big deal. However, for self-driving cars, you cannot assume that all scenarios are given. You might have a completely different scenario, and you want to make the right decision. So you can see deep learning might be risky, might be very risky if you just want to use those things, standard things to, to do something uh, very complex. Here you can see some applications. This is called internet classification. Basically, there are so many images. There are in total 1,000 classes, mice, mite, and so on. So, so many different classes, and uh, 1 million training images, and uh, 150,000 test images. You want to classify, do classification, you want to see what's inside, what's in the image. And this is the top five error rate of deep learning. It's 15.3%. Uh, and if you don't use deep learning, the error rate will be something like 26.2%. You can see deep learning really outperforms all other kind of learning machines in a significant way. This is just error rate, the lower the better. So that's why in image processing and computer vision nowadays, almost everyone just uses deep learning. Because you can automatically extract those meaningful features, okay? You can really mimic how we process the data. And here you can see another uh, application, it's called a style transfer. Here, this is a, a painting by Vincent uh, Van Gogh. You know this image, this painting, and this is the, the two images is a picture about uh, in Chibinge, where I lived uh, several years ago. So basically, you can transfer the style from this painting to this image. Finally, you can see, oh, you can have generated, artificially generated paintings. This is cool. How can you do this? Basically, it's because with deep networks, you can learn two different things. One is about the content, the other is about the style, right? And then you can keep the same style for different images, for different contents. You can generate new images with the same style, but very different contents, okay? So now, basically, you can generate a lot of fake things, which seem really real. For automatic uh, self-driving car, this is very essential. In many, in many senses, uh, for instance, you just have, you have a lot of sensors, have a camera, right, uh, on the car, and you just have videos or images, and you want to recognize what they are doing, right? And with deep learning, you can do a very good job. That's why deep learning is an essential part of self-driving uh, self cars. And here you can see another application. In the last five years, basically, people have, um, now I think people just use the deep learning for translation. You can see Chinese characters here, and you can see the English uh, translation here. Sometimes it really it works very well. This is no use, this is no use. What do you mean? This is boring, trivial, don't mind. So this is pretty good for this part. But for this one, I think it's very bad. Right? Um, you can <coughs> basically, it doesn't make sense. You cannot really see the correspondence between this sentence and this sentence. So there's still a long way to go. It's not as intelligent as humans. But in some cases, especially those very popular scenarios, Deep learning can really do a very, very good job. Okay. Now let's talk about chess and go play, uh, playing. So in 1996, Deep Blue, a, a chess playing computer, um, basically defeats, defeated humans. Uh, it's a, it was a big news at that moment. This is the Deep Blue, the computer, and. At that moment, people thought that, okay, yeah, chess is very simple because the search space is very, very low. I don't think it's possible at all to, for a computer to play Go. Why? As you can see from here, if you play Go, the search space is huge. 
there are so many possibilities for next moves, right? And it's really difficult to find the optimal decision. However, in uh, 2016, AlphaGo defeated Lee Seidel, right? Big news in 2017, uh, sorry, 2016. And at that moment, the Kujie said, oh, AlphaGo cannot beat me. He said that. One year later, AlphaGo master defeats Kujie in a very, very kind of cool way, right? And after that, Kujie said, oh, last year, AlphaGo was still quite human-like when it played, but this year, it became like a god of Go. C computers, computer systems can really quickly improve themselves by making use of reinforcement learning. And last year, we got AlphaGo Zero, which significantly outperformed AlphaGo Master. And this, this guy, this system, makes use of a new, new uh, kind of learning schema. Why can AlphaGo defeat all the people, all humans? Why? Essentially, there are three components. You can see AlphaGo just makes use of reinforcement learning, right? Because you have a teacher, you just want to do a good job. You have to receive a reward after your uh, your moves. And the deep networks. Here, if you remember, you want to determine the, the optimal action. And also, you want you have to receive the reward from the environment. Both of them are modeled by very deep networks. The search space is huge. That's why we want to do deep networks. We need to see, uh, to, to capture the best, best possibilities. And also, to reduce the search, uh, search space, AlphaGo use the Monte Carlo tree search. It's a very efficient way to, to do a search to find the best strategy. And finally, another the final reason is that in the last ten years we got a lot of computational power, computational resources with the GPUs. Without the GPU, it's not possible to develop such a system. Okay, with those things now, they can really do a very good job. If you if you want to, uh, want them to play go, here you can see how Alpha Zero works. It says that Alpha Go, Alpha Zero starts from scratch. So at the beginning, it does not know how to learn how to play Go at all. This is called self-play reinforcement learning. There's no teacher. There's no experience with humans. Okay? The system just got to know the rules, the rules of playing Go uh, at the very beginning. That's all. That's the only input. There's no other, any kind of data. And the input after that, then the machine asks um, the machine just try to improve the performance by playing against himself. Okay, this is cool. Why? Because now you can see with the machine learning, we want to make use of data. We want to extract the information from data, but now no data is needed. No data is required for the system to improve. It's like Chen Chang is like so you hu bo, Basically, you can just play against yourself. And finally, you can become better and better. You can see after uh, 20 days, 21 days, the, this system outperformed AlphaGo Master, which defeated Kejie. OK. This is how it works, basically. All those, in principle, it's very similar. Very similar. You just make use of reinforcement the learning. It's very clear. You make use of different representations for those things, because they should be very flexible. And then you make use of some optimization method to reduce the search space, and then you use computers. You can solve the problems. It's not really not surprising at all. Why? It's just like we humans cannot run as fast as, uh, as cars, right? That's clear. So if you want to play game clearly, the designed computer will have a better performance, as long as the goal task is very precise. OK? Finally, I let me spend 10 minutes on code learning. First of all, you can see here, uh, I gave a code picture, it's a synthetic one, code picture. We have different features or different things to describe the scenario. Here is the lung cancer. You can see smoking is the cause of lung cancer. By this, I mean the cause. And the genetics is also cause of lung cancer. And lung cancer causes coughing and so on. So from this picture, you can really see the relationships between different features, causal relationships. What do we mean by causal relations? You can see, by the way, here we have a word expert in causality. 
Yeah. So uh, maybe you can explain this. <laughs> yeah, I do that. Right now. <laughs> so here you can see if you want to change this, if you want to change this lung cancer, what can you change? What variable or what feature should you change? If you change this, it's not going to use by at all. You have to change the causes, right? Now this means not all features are created equal. If you want to change something, right? If you want to manipulate real world, you have to pay attention to the causal rules. But before, I didn't talk about the causality at all. And in this example, but in Hong Kong, I say uh, fraud is really a big issue, right? You want to prevent uh, financial frauds. This is a very simplified uh, causal picture. Being greedy is a cause uh, for the person to be a fraud. And for fraud, clearly, when a, when a guy is doing something evil, he's nervous, right? So we have this very, uh, very simplified uh, call picture. Now, if you want to detect whether this person is a fraud, you can make use of both of them, right? Clearly, they're useful. If you want to, if, if you want to estimate, if you want to see whether this is a uh, fraud. However, you can see this guy is really, is really reliable to make use of this feature. But this one, sometimes it's dangerous to use this one. Why? Because, suppose I'm a fraud. If I realize that you detect whether I'm a fraud by making use of this feature, I can pretend, I can change my behavior, right? Criminals can change their behavior, can change the patterns. That's why it's really difficult to make use of those features, although they are useful. However, if they really change this, the result will be, will be changed. He or she is not a fraud anymore, right? That's why you can see features are not really, uh, cannot be treated equal, even if you just want to make a prediction, why? In the uh, intelligent system, basically, you have to pay attention to the different rules, causal rules of the, of the features for reliability, because those features can be easily changed by the subjects. Okay? Again, let's look at this picture. If you can do this very well, you can easily learn to play too long, right? So, why can we do so? This is because we have a causal representation. We have something causal to represent the skills, right? And then we know what part is, you can decompose the whole task into a lot of small, small tasks or small modules. A lot of modules you use here can be reused here, right? That's why we can do, we can do transfer. And this is, the, when, we, when I say modules, it's a causality term. It's a causal term, causal module. Why do we like a causality? Because if you use a causal understanding, a causal picture of the world, you can just use divine and conquer. Why? If the system is causal, then you can just decompose the whole system into a lot of small systems which are independent. They are not connected. So when I say raining causes the wet ground, how I make it rain is totally irrelevant to how raining causes the wet ground. That's why we can decompose the whole world into a lot of small systems. That's why we can build airplanes, right? Very complex. However, we know the causality, we know modularity. You can take care of uh, basically different people can take care of different modules and finally you have an airplane. Okay, similarly here, for self driving cars, if you just use rule based systems, just the rules, then clearly it's dangerous. But if you use the causality, if you see why we make different decisions, you might be able to do a better job. Okay. So here, let me just briefly uh, explain what we can benefit from causal thinking, thinking causally. Here, this is a very classic example. Smoking causes yellow fingers, sometimes no, this was the case, and lung cancer, or incidence of lung cancer. So now you can see, if you want to predict lung cancer, you can make it with yellow fingers. However, if you want to change this, say if you, if you want, want to change the incidence of uh, uh, lung cancer in a particular country area, how can you just change the colors of the fingers? Clearly, this is not useful. You have to make use of the causes to change to achieve this. That means if you want to do control or advertisement, or if you, want, if you want to develop a recommended system, you have to make use of the causal information, causal process, because you want to change the world. Okay? It's not just a prediction problem. Uh, and if you want to to, to to learning or information theory, you also want to make use of causal representations intuitively. 
Here's an example. Suppose we have some features, x, y, z, representing different things. And if you know that x is a cos of y and that y is a cos of z, then you know, oh, if I, for the bigger system with x, y, z together, I know x cos of y and then uh, cos of z. I have a better understanding of the world. However, if you know that, if you don't use the causality, then probably you cannot say anything. So suppose I know x and y are related, y and z are related. Then I have no idea about the relationship between x and z. They can be related, they can be identical, they can, be, they can even be independent, right? So in this case, if you just use dependence or, or correlation or basic dependence, you cannot say anything about the whole big system. But if you use causality, you can easily do information theory. That's why we have a better, big picture of the world. And uh, also, according to uh, Carl Jung, causal thinking gave rise to modern science in the Western societies. They try to address, uh, they try to answer the question why. If you want to ask why question, you have a better understanding. Also, you know how to fuse. You have to, you know how to integrate different uh, kind of information. Okay. Here you can see another example. This is known as Simpson's paradox. We suppose we have two. This is a real data set collected in the 1970s. We have two groups of patients, kidney stones. They have kidney stones, small stones, large stones. For both of them, you can see we have two treatments. For both of them, treatment A is better because the recovery rate is higher. Okay, it's better. However, if you merge the data, if you put the data together, the two groups together. Finally, statistically speaking, treatment B is better because the recovery rate is higher. Now comes the problem. Suppose you have a new patient. What, which recommendation, which uh, treatment would you recommend? Would you recommend A or B? Maybe I should. Uh, any idea? So you can see overall, B is better. The so recovery rate is higher, and if you just consider separate groups, A is always better. This is funny, right? So which one would you recommend if you have a new patient? If you want to recommend A? Yeah, good. Oh, oh okay. If you want to recommend B? Also, good. 50-50. So clearly, you want to make a recommendation by make, because of the causality, because of the treatment effect, not because of the correlation. The correlation is not trustable. Here you can see another picture to explain uh, similar things. Here for each age group, you have a lot of people. For each age group, you can see the more exercise you do, the less cholesterol. That's very good. That's why we should do uh, more exercise. However, if you watch the data, if you put all people together, you can see there's a positive correlation between exercise and cholesterol. That means, oh, the more exercise you do, the more cholesterol you are going to have. This is completely wrong, because you cannot just trust, trust the correlation. Right? You want to change this. You, want, you, you care about the effect of intervention, the effect of the choice. So how can you solve the problem? This is because here we have a something hidden, stone size. Because of this guy, the correlation or the relationship between treatment and recovery could be almost arbitrary. That's why you cannot trust the pattern of dependence. You have to go back to the causal process if you want to make a good prediction, a good recommendation. Okay, that's why it's called a paradox. And here you can see our last example. Here, if you go back 50 years in America, you can see that uh, at the colleges, on average, female students are smarter than male students. Why? We believe that overall, for the full population, females and males are kind of smarter. I don't think females are kind of significantly smarter than males, right? So how can you explain this phenomenon? Females, on average, are smarter than males. If you talk about college students 50 years ago, this is because here we have gender, at that time, 50 years ago, gender and IQ are both causes of being admitted to college. They are both causes. And although they were originally independent, they had no relationship between gender and IQ, okay, completely irrelevant. However, 
Given this guy, given B and admitted to college, they are related in some way. If you think of the problem this way, everything will be clear. Right? This is another example. So it's a multiple problem. Uh, I guess you know different words. Maybe you know the Chinese version of this problem. It's very simple. Uh, the game is played this way. The host, the money hall, has placed $1,000 behind one of the three doors. And if you find the right door, you get $100. If you find the wrong door, you get nothing. Okay? Now, you can make a decision. You can choose one. Suppose you choose A. Suppose you just, you just choose A. Now, the host open door B and just say, oh, see, this door is uh, empty, nothing behind the door. Would you like to stick with your own the, the uh, old decision or switch your decision to C? So would you like to stick to the original one, A, or change your mind? Is, is the story clear? Okay, so if you want to stick with your original decision, A, let me know. And if you want to change your mind, Okay, that's good. So basically, uh, now average you are going to make money. So here you can see the story, the causal story, where the money is. Here, when you make the when you make the decision, when you make the choice, you have no idea about it. That's why your initial choice is not related to where the money is, right? Completely irrelevant. However, the which door is opened by which door to be uh, opened by the host depends on both of them. Right? As a host, I cannot open the door, you just choose, and I cannot open the door where the money is. Right? So the decision depends on those, uh, those two things. This is the effect of those two things. And given this common effect, given this guy, they become dependent. That means you should rethink about your decision. Your initial decision has some information about where the money is. Okay? Actually, if you Go further, you can find, figure out that, oh, I should, so I should change my mind. That this is the, the probability of having money behind the door will be different. Okay, so I just talked about what we can benefit from causal thinking. If you think, if you think of the causal process, you can see a lot of problems will become very simple and intuitive. Now let me see, uh, let me just report some results regarding how to discover causal information. Here you can see an example. This paper was published in Science uh, four years ago. Basically, they reported that the large-scale psychological differences in, within China can be explained by rice versus wheat agriculture. The other was said the psychological differences in the humans in China are caused by agriculture. Clearly, you cannot change anything. You cannot change something to see the effect to discover the causal relations. You just have some observed data points, right? Observe, observe the values, observations. You have to analyze those things to discover the underlying causal process, to recover the underlying causal process. If you know the causal process, you know what to do. Because if you know why this happens, I can tell you. Right? If you don't, if you just see the association, see the relationship, dependent pattern, you can do nothing. Because you don't know whether it's the cause, effect, or, or maybe this guy was produced by the same curve, right? So how can you solve the problem? Uh, you, you have to make use of data, and this is another example. Here, x axis is the chocolate consumption uh, consumption uh, per capita, and the y axis is the number of Nobel laureates per 10 million population. They are very nicely related, right? So on average, you can see the more chocolate you have the more likely it is for you to get a Nobel Prize, right? If you believe this is the case. If you think this is a causal process, you can do so. But is this causal? You really want to see the underlying causal relations, underlying this picture pattern, right? If you have a wrong causal story, you can do something naive or even stupid, right? So that's why we want to do causal discovery. How can we do this? Here you can see a picture. Basically, for different causal pictures, we have different properties of the data. In this case, smoking causes cancer and smoking causes yellow fingers. Now you can see, given smoking, given this, if you fix smoking, they become, they are not relevant at all. Right? 
that means if I know this guy is smoking, then the can uh, whether this guy will can, is likely to have cancer is not relevant to whether he has yellow fingers. If I fix this, so and on the other hand, here you can see something very different: slippery ground and rain can cause the falling down. Okay, this is another color picture. Now you can see, oh, given this guy, they will become dependent. They will become related in some way. In other words, here I just want to say that different color pictures will give you different properties of the data, different statistical patterns of the data. And then by analyzing the statistical properties of the data, you can recover the color picture. Now let, let me just report some uh, results. Here my collaborator collected a lot of data. Uh, she's the archaeologist. Collect, she collected 250 skeletons all over the world, and she measured eight variables. In archaeology, people really want to understand the causal relations between all those things. Why? Because they really want to see why people in different areas look different. And they also want to make in prediction to the future. In 500, in 5,000 years, how will human beings look like, right? They want to see the, fi the features, uh, the, proper, the, the, the variables that can determine how we look like. So we analyze the data. Basically, with some method called the discovery method, the, you already saw the idea. So you just want to analyze the statistical property of the data, and then you can recover some property of the causal process. Here you can see, oh, it's nice. Basically, a lot of the relations here are consistent with uh, what they reported in the literature. For instance, climate causes the cranial size. That's why in North Europe, usually, people have a kind of larger cranial size. If it's very cold, then the cranial cell can be bigger so that it warm the air. Okay? So, and also we can discover something very new. Uh, uh, I skip that part. But basically, you can see by making use of machine learning methods to analyze the data, you can really go back to the causal process, analyze the data. So, causality is not, is not really mysterious anymore. Here you can see another example. We analyzed the Hunger stock market uh, 10 years ago. This is a, basically here you can see the causal relations among uh, major stocks in Hong Kong. This is the Hunsung Bank, this is HSBC. There's a causal relation from Hunsung Bank to HSBC, and we gave interpretations for different kind of relations. But basically, whenever they suppose a, uh, a company A owes, owns some uh, shares of company B, then there's a causal relation from B to A. Here, HSBC owns something like sixty percent or fifty percent of Hong Kong Bank. That's why they have a significant causal relation from Hong Kong to HSBC, and so on. So we can really see the underlying causal relation between different companies by analyzing their stock returns, daily returns. Okay. And now let me give you another uh, intuition. In this picture, you have, you can see two things. One is the figure of the person, the other is the shadow, right? And suppose this is me. Now, if I go to a completely new environment where you don't know where the light is, so you can see that you can easily predict a lot of things about the figure, about my, myself, by analyzing the shadow, right? I, I think you have the experience. You can see a lot of information of the figure by analyzing the shadow, even in a completely new environment. Right? You don't know where the light is. You have no idea. How you can make this prediction. However, if you know where I am, you know a lot of things about me, you cannot predict. You have no idea about the shadow. Right? Is that clear? Because you don't know where you, you have no idea where the light is from. Okay? So this means we when we make a prediction, we really care about the causal rules. Why? Clearly, the figure is the cause, the shadow is the effect. In this case, if everything can change, predicting the cause from effect is easier because the effect already con contains the information of the cause. However, predicting the effect from cause is impossible because you have no idea about the environment. Okay? The environment, the environment could be totally different from, from the, uh, your experience. Okay. So we made use of this intuition. We developed a lot of methods to do domain adaptation or transfer learning. You want to make use of your previous data to make predictions of the future. And you know the future is different. 
Here, this is a um, remote sensing image classification problem. We have two, we have images collected from two different uh, in two different areas. Uh, they have different distributions. They have different soils and so on. You can see by making use of this color picture, the online class, online color level like water, hippograss, grass, causing the features of the image. We make use of this color picture, and then you can see by making use of this, the misclassification rate is much much lower than previous results. So even if you want to make a prediction, you can really benefit from the understanding of the color process behind the data. Okay. So then, now let me uh, explain something about the relationship between deep learning and causal representation. So recently, you can see deep learning has been very popular. Why? In our brain, you can see we have deep structure. We have so many neurons. At least for some, uh, say for the real cortex, there are so many layers we want to meet with before. We have deep structure in our brain. Now you can see, oh, with the deep structure, in many scenarios, you can really do a much better job. That's good. We want, we want to use deep learning. On the other hand, we humans and intelligent systems, we really have high level causal representation of the world. We know how things are related, right? We have higher level, high level feature representations, right? So that means if you want to design something very intelligent, you might need to combine the deep learning, the flexibility of deep learning with the causal representation, graphical representation of the world. So that's why we developed something to, to make use of this idea. You, you can use deep network to uh, model the generating process, the color process. However, you allow different things. You can explain the difference between different scenarios and so on. So I, I will skip the detail, but basically, you want to explain why the same thing could have different reflections, could have different images in different scenarios. If you really understand this, I can say, you understand the problem. Why? Well, when I say, I understand this, what does it mean? I can understand different things, I can generate new, new data points, new instances, which are reasonable. So here you can see some application. At the beginning, the system just saw this image and this image, this set of images and this set of images, only two. Now the, the uh, system just analyzed the two sets of images, and finally you can see, oh, they are different. They are different only in a very simple way. Basically, those images were turned by rotating those images in some way. The system could extract such information, and then you can generate new data points, arbitrary new data points. Here you can see you can have different values for the uh, changing part. Then you can see, oh, I can use different values. I can rotate the image in an arbitrary way. Well, very simple, very powerful. Here you can see another example. In the same way, you can change the hair color. This is the true image. I can just change the, the color of hair by making use of the system. I, just, I can change the motion expression. Smiling, now it's not smiling, but it's very natural. This image looks kind of reasonable, right? You can generate a lot of artificial things in this way. That makes sense. Why? We can combine the very complex generation process and the very nice color representations of the process. Okay? So let me summarize. So machine learning is training. Machine learning has received a lot of applications in different fields, especially in very complex uh, environments. And now that we have huge data, we have so many genes, so many drugs, so many species, and we want to make prediction. We want to analyze the relationship between uh, different things. And uh, in the last 20 years, we have we had uh, improved the machine learning algorithms and also ways to improve data capture, networking, and we have faster computers, we have better resources. And now you can see we have a better understanding of machine learning. Okay? Previously, we just tried to uh, solve problems in an efficient way. Right? We use computers. computers. Computers are very good at computation. That's why we make, we make use of computers. Now, we can, really think, we can really figure out what we mean by intelligence. And finally, we can equip the computers with the capacity of intelligence. So basically, we are getting closer and closer to intelligence. And industry is a, industry a lot. Of, there are so many problems that should be, uh, can be solved in machine learning. That's why it's so proper prosperous in, uh, in industry. Okay, to summarize, machine learning is a really important problem. And 
ubiquitous problem in science, engineering, and beyond. Almost everywhere you have to deal with data. You have to learn something from data. That's why we always make use of machine learning. And I hope that in this talk you uh, you can see the basic intuition behind the different machine learning tasks and different machine learning algorithms. You know how to interpret the results, and you know what method you can use if you have a problem. And uh, still, if you want to really achieve the intelligence of the machines, there is still a long way to go. So a lot of people are still thinking about how to really uh, understand intelligence and how to give machines this ability. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have uh, five minutes uh, for, for questions. So, questions? Yeah, please. Um, I, I'm curious in asking, would you maybe put a guess on why human brain in many areas, say graphical processing, is so much more efficient than a machine. Say, by graphical processing, you mean? Say, say for some, 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 other t some tasks, human beings are just so efficient in learning uh, in comparison to a machine. Now, is it a yes. hardware problem or is it just the algorithms? Very good, very good question. So, at least there are two reasons. First, we have those we have understanding, we have represent, better representations of the problems, right? We learn, right? We learn, you can see, even when we were born, we already had some knowledge, right? This is very likely to be true. And also, we have life, life non-learning. When you see an image, basically, you already train yourself for such a long time. That's why you have a better representation of the world, of everything. If you have a better representation, you can easily understand what's going on and you can process the data in an efficient way. Right? So the key problem is representation. And it's not about hardware. Machine can do the same thing as long as we know the principles underlying this kind of learning. Okay? So hardware is not a problem at all because you can really mimic the brain. We just have neurons, those units, we have connections, right? Now you can see with deep networks, it's pretty similar. And also, we cannot say that our brain is optimal. Why? Our brain is designed this way, right? We want to make good prediction, and at the same time, we want to save energy. We have so many things to achieve with our brain. But with computers, usually we don't really care about energy saving, right? That's why computers will do better if you really see the principles online of things. And also, we do this because we can do transfer. We learn something from before, right? And in the future, we can use it. For computers, now we cannot do so. That's why computers do become stupid, right? You have to relearn everything. Yeah. Is this the answer to your question? Yeah. Okay. So, so you think it's a software problem? Exactly. The yeah. principle uh, understanding problem. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I just for the, for the same question, I see your point about the understanding, but uh, I thought that it was strange what you said uh, that the hardware of the brain is not uh, superior to what we have. Um, I mean, the number of neurons, for example, right? In these deep learning examples, you have 200 by 200 or something um, as an input uh, layer, and uh, in the brain, you have billions of neurons, right, uh, that work in parallel. Uh, then the brain doesn't do back propagation, right? It does. Uh, uh, it encodes uh, the neurons encode in a totally different way uh, instead of uh, summarizing or yep. using sigmoid functions and so on, right? So, uh, can you really say that uh, you you can compare the hardware uh, of a neural network with the hardware of the brain in this way and say that the one is superior to the other? Uh, here, we, I'm not saying that the hardware basically we can have a better hardware. I mean, hardware is not an essential issue. Because we have the ability to become the, I think, principles. Again, principles. Now, you can see some groups are trying to uh, build human brains with, uh, with units, right? With their neurons. They can do this. 
The problem is now we don't know we don't know how to make use of such a kind of large system, right? If you don't have a principle, you don't have the proper task or proper set of tasks for the hardware, it's useless. But if you answer the principles, then you can always come up with a suitable uh, hardware to implement that. Yeah, that's my that's my problem. So essential problem is not how hardware, it's how to understand the problems. And then if needed, you can always design hardware to do so. Is that the answer to your question? Okay, good. Um, maybe one last question, if there's any. Yeah, maybe I'll ask a very simple, so I think towards the end, yeah, you talk about intelligence, and then actually in the previous slide, you put intelligence in square quotes. Um, so, so what's your view of intelligence? Uh, do, 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 for example, uh, when do you think uh, then a uh, machine can be said to be intelligent? So I know this is a big question. Yeah. I just wonder about your view. And I, I don't think there is a definite answer, a uh, good answer to this question. Right? Some people said we cannot really understand the brain because we are humans, right? We are we limited, it's our brain. And uh, by intelligence, I mean the following thing. I don't think we have a final answer to the intelligence. However, whenever you make intelligence precise, you can always achieve that. Okay, so you're with for Neumann. Right. <laughs> so you, you discover the problem you want to solve, and then you, want, you can see how and why we can solve those problems in a better way. We say this, we are more intelligent, right? And then you understand what we mean by intelligence, and then the machine can have the capacity. I mean, even intended, we have, I don't think we have a real kind of precise definition of intelligence. But whenever you have a better um, definition, a better characterization, because of the problems, you can achieve intelligence in that way, step by step. Is that it? So yeah, but then by this, I guess by this standard, then uh, you can actually have machine intelligence very different from human intelligence. Exactly. And I think you also admit the possibility that machine can become much more intelligent than humans. Okay. So we are not, we say we are intelligent, right? But we came up with the word intelligent to describe our humans. What do we mean by intelligence? It's not precise at all. Yeah, but maybe some other, maybe God, right? Say, oh, they are not humans, they are just machines, right? They don't have intelligence at all. So that's why uh, we should understand the problems and we should uh, make it precise what we want to achieve from the from what we want to achieve and finally we can really equip the machines the abilities we want. Okay. Yeah, so I suggest we thank our speakers. Uh, thank our speaker uh, with the applause. Thank you. Thank you.